Number two, Genesis chapter number two. We are working our way through this first book of the Bible. We told you last week that uh, when we finished up through Revelation and the last book of our Bible, we thought it would be appropriate to go back to the beginning. And that is the title of our lesson series, In the Beginning. Lesson number six tonight, Genesis chapter two. And last week we left off uh, after we looked at the first uh, few verses in chapter two. I told you tonight that we would drop down to verse number 10. Last week we covered the completion of the six days of creation and we summarized all that we had looked at. We saw, it. We saw also here at the beginning of chapter 2 in verse 2 that God rested on the seventh day. And we told you that God did not rest out of physical exhaustion as some would have you believe. Uh, God is a spirit. He does not get tired. He's not bound by physical limitations like what we are God never gets a cold he never gets tired out uh, he is just uh, he's uh, all powerful and he can do whatever he needs to do whenever he needs to do it but I also told you last week that the word here in verse number two of chapter two just in way of review where the Bible says that on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested I told you last week that that word rested carries with it the idea of stopping an action. Uh, so God on the seventh day simply stopped creating, stopped making. He ceased from his work. And that was the thought process behind that word rested. Unlike what we think about when we say rest, we think that we're going to just go to sleep or take a nap or whatever it is that we do when we rest sit in the lazy boy and pull our feet up. No, God basically just means that he, here in this verse, that he just stopped doing what he was doing. We also saw in verse number three of chapter two, God blessed the seventh day. It did not say that it was holy. Uh, he said it was set apart. He sanctified it. If you look at verse three, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that in it, he, re he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And the only reason that we have this out there in, in our Bible study camps around the world today, this thing about the seventh day being holy, uh, was because uh, the new translators of the new Bible versions have inserted the word holy instead of the word sanctified. And uh, holy and sanctified, uh, you might say, have some commonality, but they're not the same word. And uh, when something is sanctified, it's set apart. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, done for a specific reason. But God said that the seventh day, and he said he rested and or blessed it and sanctified it. So uh, that word holy has been inserted into the narrative. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, in many of our new modern Bible versions, that word has been substituted from sanctified They've substituted the word holy. And so um, that's why I believe we don't need, uh, you know, there, one of the reasons why I'm so opposed to these new Bible versions that come out every other year, it seems like. Every year there's a new one, a new and improved version, right? Uh, first of all, there's no need. Well, we've got the Word of God, we have it in our hands tonight, and and uh, we've had it for a long time, and ever since any of us have been around, we've had the Word of God. And God promised long ago to preserve His Word. And so, uh, two things that say something different are not the same. So if I've got a book over here that says one thing, and I've got another book over here that says something different, they're not the same. And so what you have to ask yourself is if God promised to preserve his word, and he did, we have all kinds of scripture to tell us that God said he would preserve his word. Uh, if two different books are not the same thing, and uh, you have a new and improved version over here, and you've got an old one that you've been reading over here that's been fine up until this point, they both can't be the word of God. And so... 
what we have to realize is that when God promised to preserve it, if the new version, as many claim, is the word of God, then that means what were all of the people doing before that? They didn't have the word of God? And so it's just really, uh, as I said, the first reason I think it's, it's so silly to get into all these new versions of the Bible, we don't need them. Very simple, we don't need them. Uh, second of all, the other reason that I, I am opposed to all these new Bible versions is there's an arrogant spirit about the new version crowd. Uh, they assume they're more learned than those who came before them. And uh, they'll make statements like, well, you know, these old guys, you know, they didn't have what we have. And, you know, they didn't know what we know and all this crazy talk. But we remember when we look at our, our, our translators of our uh, King James Bible that we believe is the best uh, uh, Bible in the English speaking tongue for us English speaking people. Um, uh, these men were learned men. Uh, they were the best scholars of their day, bar none. Uh, God chose the best of the best. Uh, most of these men that worked on our King James Bible, they could speak four or five languages by the time they were 10 years old. Who does that today? Is there any men around today that are learning four or five different languages by the time they're 10 years old? Uh, good night, I have a hard enough time just with the English language, let alone memorizing five or ten languages and, and, you know, by the time I'm eight. And not only could they speak these languages, they could read and write them. And so uh, when, when we hear men today say, well, you know, I'm a better scholar than, you know, some of these uh, guys that were involved in the early translation, it, it's just arrogance. And then third, there's nothing new to point out. You know, there again, there's another reason they say, well, you know, we've got new revelation. No, you don't. God said when he was done, when he was done writing, he said, amen. And uh, that's all we need to know. There's no, uh, no, uh, there's nothing new to point out in these new versions uh, that God hasn't already addressed. And so we can be sure that we don't need those things. And so... When you see these Bibles, insert words, take words out, put new words in. Uh, I just think it's arrogance. But anyway, don't y'all get me started on that. Let's get back to our text. God told the Israelites to set this day apart. He told them to set apart the seventh day as he had in the creation process and worship him. Uh, remember that he was the creator of all things. We also need to take more time to appreciate what God has done. You know, it would be well for us as well to take time away every once in a while and appreciate what God has done for us. Uh, we don't do that enough. Uh, we just take things for granted mo most of the time. So let's pick it up in Genesis 2.10 tonight. Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. The Bible says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads on the screen tonight I hope they're up there is there a map up there there is uh, that map represents what we know it's called the fertile crescent and uh, it is the birthplace of human society or human history if you can see it there's a there's a dotted line that kind of uh, it's in sort of a crescent shape there if you will and uh, that area uh, where the uh, Tigris and Euphrates rivers meet, um, I don't have a pointer I could point, but I don't have, but if you can see on the map there, uh, right there where the word Iraq is, uh, the Euphrates is just to the right of that. And then right there where it says Baghdad, yeah, thank you. Uh, I knew I could count on him. <laughs> he, he does such a great job. Anyway, there's the Euphrates River, and then just a ways over is the Tigris. And uh, right as you come downward, uh, just come down with your arrow, right down in this area here is where the Garden of Eden was believed to have been. And so that whole area was, was, uh, was the uh, birthplace, if you will, of, of society. And I just wanted to point that out to you so you could get an idea 
Uh, I've had people ask me before, where was the Garden of Eden? Well, that's the best that we know uh, of where it was because the Bible tells us that. And we'll see that here as we look a little bit further. But all living creatures, listen, they rely on water to survive. Uh, during this recent hot spell, as you know, plants in the gardens have needed watering. Amen. From time to time, we go out in the evening when it's not quite so hot, water the plants. And they let you know they need water because they're very droopy. Uh, their countenance is very droopy in the hot sun. They, uh, when they don't have adequate water, a plant will begin to droop. And once they receive that water, it's amazing. They just sort of perk right back up again. And uh, they look like their life has been restored. All creatures require water as well. Without water, none would survive. Water is one of the greatest forces on earth. And it can be a great blessing, but it also has the power to be quite destructive, as we have seen here in Vermont over the last couple of years. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, uh, the Bible says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And so we learn that all creatures that are in existence began from water. It's been said that if you look, if you took all the water out of the human body, you would lose approximately 50 to 75 percent of the body's mass. And uh, is that true, uh, Dr. Uh, Canile? You don't know. He's, he's not going to say. That's not in your thesis that you're going to defend this, freak, this Friday? No? Okay. Well, we'll let you off the hook then. But uh, we'll just have to trust the scientists that I read. They said 50 to 75% of your body's mass would be lost if the water was removed. Water loss in the body needs to be replaced every day. I think everyone knows that. But on average, we lose 2 to 3 liters of water a day. Even more on hot summer days when, when we perspire. But, so in Genesis 2, we have newly formed man... Uh, in his state of innocence, uh, we find him dwelling in a most beautiful place that we saw up on the map, the Garden of Eden. And here's the, here's the truth of that. All is well between man and his maker. And a river see, is seen flowing, uh, the, the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, is seen flowing uh, right there in the garden area on either side. Everything has, is as God created it. If we were to fast forward at this point to Ezekiel chapter 47, we won't tonight for the sake of time, but if we were, uh, and we were to examine the scriptures in, in Ezekiel 47, uh, we would see some tribulation descriptive com uh, content, and we would see the following. We would see the Lord Jesus Christ has come in power and glory, and he's established his kingdom on earth. We know it as the millennial kingdom. War has ended. Rebellion is put down. God is again dwelling with man. Just as it was in the Garden of Eden. This, this scenario that we find Adam and Eve in before the fall will be replayed in the millennial kingdom when the Lord reigns and rules on the throne in Jerusalem just as it was in the garden. Isn't it interesting how things have a way of just coming full circle many times? Uh, so out of the throne at Jerusalem during the millennial reign, guess what flows out of the throne? A river of water. Like the river from Eden, this one eventually covers the globe with healing and cleansing. And after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness does, uh, does dwell, we are afforded a glimpse into the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, where the Lamb dwells with the redeemed. This is all future stuff talked about in Ezekiel chapter 47. And then according to Revelation 22 verse 1 that we just finished up studying here a while back, we see from beneath His throne there issues a river of water. So there is water again. Water plays an important part throughout the whole Bible. Spoken of in many, many cases. 
I didn't do a search of water, but I'm sure it's probably in the thousands as it's mentioned. And uh, in Revelation 22, verse 1, the Bible says, He showed me a pure river. We don't see too many of those these days. I don't know if you've noticed the river down here. It's just muddy and terribly dirty, and it doesn't seem to ever get calmed down before the rains come and it gets all worked up again. But here it says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. The narrative in Revelation 22 is reminiscent of the creation story where man and his God dwell together in unity. That was God's plan from the beginning. Uh, If Adam and Eve had just simply done and been obedient to what God had said, uh, we would all be dwelling in uh, tranquility today rather than this sin-cursed world that we're living in. So there we find a river of water flowing out from that tranquil scene. And this tranquility can only be had when man's sins have been biblically dealt with. Before the, flood, or before the sin, or before the Garden of Eden, the, the fall in the garden, everything was tranquil and as God intended it to be. But once sin entered, that tranquility, that peace, was gone. Is it any wonder that we live in chaos today? Chaos and confusion with not even one ounce of peace in people's lives these days. I don't remember where I was yesterday, but I came out of a store and I was walking to my truck and all of a sudden I heard this awful scream and it was a young man screaming at his wife. And uh, I don't know what she did, but he was cussing her and right out in public. Just sad, sad. But that's the world we're living in today, unfortunately. And uh, I hate to see that. It takes every ounce of fabric that I have not to say something and get involved with it. But, you know, sometimes those things are best left alone. Uh, they turn into big confusion otherwise. But, uh, but that's the way people's lives are today. They're filled with chaos. Chaos and violence and confusion and no peace. And this is as a result, though, of their unwillingness to repent and turn their hearts to God. Oh, how many men's lives would be so much different if they were willing to turn their hearts to God and repent of their ways and just turn to God. You know, as we study the book of Genesis, it's often taught, and I'm sure you probably have heard this before, that God placed the curse of work on man because of his sin. That's not correct. It's not a correct way to teach the Word of God, especially in this part of Genesis. Such is not the case. According to Genesis 2, verse 15, the Bible says, And the Lord Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. The dressing and keeping of the garden and the naming of the animals show that man arrived on the scene capable of both mental and physical labor. So this all happened, by the way, before Genesis chapter 3 when the fall occurred. So we can't, we can't teach the Bible and tell people that work is a curse of God. It isn't. Uh, because it all this, this, uh, this giving of, of responsibility to Adam happened before the fall. God put man to work as soon as he made him. Work is always going to be part of man's life. It's part of God's plan. And some suppose that in the ages to come, we'll sh- we, we, all, we won't have to work anymore. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. Uh, certainly when we're with the Lord, we'll be at rest. Uh, you know, as far as uh, some of the things that we, we were involved with now, but we certainly shall not be idle. We'll be given responsibility. God will have something for everyone to do. I've heard preachers say this before, and I think it's a good saying. Uh, If you don't like worshiping now, you better get used to it, because when you get to the presence of the Lord, you're going to be worshiping. If you don't like it now, you better find a way to get used to it and get liking it, because that's what you'll be doing. And so, granted, we shall all uh, be at rest, but certainly we'll have some things to do. Idleness is not good for anyone. 
Idleness usually leads to sinfulness. Uh, when we don't have anything to do, when we don't have anything to, con- con- to concentrate on, to think about, our minds begin to wander, and guess what? They usually wander towards sinfulness. And so, the same idea is found in Numbers chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, where the Bible says, And they shall keep his charge, and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the con- congregation, to do the service of the tabernacle, and they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. So even when God designed the, the tabernacle over here and gave it to the Israelites and gave them specific instructions about how to do things and how to go about taking care of what he had given, uh, part of that was service and serving. Some Christians have the idea that when they come to church, they sit down in the pews and they say, well, serve me. Well, that's not what church is about. Uh, Church is about uh, the edifying of the body of Christ so that we can take the good news of Jesus Christ out to a lost and dying world and be a servant to others. And so this responsibility of the Levites in Numbers chapter number 3 in keeping the tabernacle in the condition required by God. Uh, what the Lord intended in the garden and, in the, and also in the tabernacle was that man, by his labor, was to preserve something in its original condition. You know, anything left to itself without attention, what happens? It begins to deteriorate. That's why we're, uh, we're, we're so interested in taking care of our church house. You know, I, I, if you can believe it, I talked to somebody when I first came here to pastor the church and started talking about doing some different things to take better care of the building. And they said this, why? It's just a church. We just come here on Sundays. And why spend money and take care of, you know, do this and do that? What difference does that make? And I was like... You've got to be kidding me. No, we're supposed to be good stewards of everything God gives us. There's a limit. You know, we don't, we don't need uh, every, every little frilly thing in the church house per se, but we ought to take good care of it. We ought to keep it clean. We ought to keep it maintenance. We ought to keep the grass cut. Why? Because it's a testimony to the community around us. I've had a lot of people stop by and say, hey, you know, this, this building looks great. There was a while there, they say, well, it looked like it was pretty, but you guys have done some good stuff here, and it's really looking nice. And, and that's a blessing, amen. Because we've taken time to work on things and make things. There's nothing worse than a Christian who does not care for what God has given him. I've gotten into some Christians' cars. Not good. I'm not saying that you've got to scrub the floor in your car every other day, but you ought to take care of it. Ought to make sure it's maintenance and the things, you know, your homes. uh, I've been in some Christians' homes that were embarrassing. Ought not that should never be named among Christians. Those things are God given. They belong to God. We're supposed to be good stewards over everything He entrusts us with. You know, Anne Marie and I have always believed that whatever place God gave us to live in the ministry if at all possible, that we always had the mindset that we should leave the places that God has given us in better shape than what we found them in upon our arrival. God's been good to us. And even when we were renting an apartment during the ministry years, the last 25 years, we've lived in some apartments. And even when we were living in apartments, we were careful to keep it clean. If something was broken, I attempted to fix it. I didn't call the landlord every time some little thing was wrong. I just fixed it. Now, too many people have the mindset. Here's here's what they say. This is not my place. I just rent this. I don't pay for it. I mean, it's not my, I don't own it. Why should I spend money and fix things? That's not my job. Hey, if God has given it to you to live in, it's your home, you ought to take care of it. You ought to be a good steward of it. Now, Obviously, common sense must play a part in this thought process as major things require 
Most landlords don't want their tenants fixing major things. I, I get that. But if you've got a squeaky door hinge, put some oil on it. Don't call the landlord and say, my door is squeaking. You know, our, we have more capability to do those things than what we give ourselves credit sometimes. But anyway, don't get me started on that. Genesis 2.15, the Bible says there, if you look at that verse again, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Uh, the word in Genesis 2.15 for dress comes from the same root word as work in Genesis 2.2. It's the same root word. Uh, the word keep simply means to maintain. Hence our common notion of a maintenance man. What does a maintenance man do? He keeps the place in good working order. That's his job. And so when we see in that verse 15 where he says to dress it and to keep it, it's just simply this. To work and to make sure you maintain what God has given in the same condition that he gives it to you. A maintenance man is not the work, not the person, is not the original maker. He's just there to, to, to preserve what's already been made. That's what Adam was tasked with by God. When God put him in the garden, he said, I want you to dress and keep it. And when mankind is given responsibilities over something, here's the truth. He's far less likely to become slothful and a bad steward. Why was it that a couple of years ago, during the height of the COVID season, that homeless people were given the Holiday Inn over in South Burlington, right off of the highway there on the corner of Dorset Street and Williston Road. And when they were done with it, it had to be torn down and totally destroyed. Why was that? It was because they didn't take care of it. They were slothful and they were given something that they didn't work for. And so consequently, they destroyed what was given. Rather than be thankful and take good care of the things that they were given, they were setting fires in the hallway, they were setting this, doing breaking this, breaking that, and the state of Vermont just stood by and did nothing. That's the world we're living in. When people are given something for free, they don't appreciate it. Not everybody, but, mo but most as Christians, we should consider it a great privilege that God allows us to care for His things. Not only care for His things, but that God allows us to work in His creation. The sad truth for Adam was that God's blessing of being in a place of great responsibility, Adam rewarded God's graciousness to him and Eve. Adam uh, rewarded God by diso with disobedience. Disobedience to God's commands. Look at Genesis chapter 2 verse, uh, let's see, uh, we know verse 17, we, we've seen that a hundred times. Look at verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. In this verse we see the truth that man was not meant to be alone. Not he was not meant to be alone and isolated from other human beings. Man has a natural need for companionship. You know, there's times, and I'm sure, I'm sure you would agree with me, that it's nice to have alone time. It's nice to be able to get alone, be able to think, you know, spend time and just not have to talk with anybody, just to be able to... But that's not the way it's supposed to be all the time. Everyone needs some time to think and be alone with their thoughts with God. And, and it's good to get alone with God in prayer and devotion time and so. But man has a natural need for companionship from other humans. Isolation is often the desire of those who suffer depression. If you talk to people who are depressed, they will tell you, when I'm depressed, when I'm in one of my depressive states, I don't want to see anyone. I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to be involved with anyone. I don't want to listen to anyone. I just want to lay in my bed. 
even to the extent of not even getting up and using the bathroom, laying there in their own waste. Interestingly, psychologists usually attempt to treat depression with medication. When God gave the cure for many a man's depression, here's what it is. Get out into the parade of life and get busy. It's amazing what work will do. Responsibility given and work done will take care of a lot of man's depression. Get busy at work or some other form of activity. Busyness is the cure for many of the mental illnesses that we see in our society today. However, God said from the beginning, man should not be alone for extended periods of time. So God made him a help me. Interestingly, he didn't make Adam and Steve. He made Adam and Eve. Amen? He brought Adam a wife called Eve, and she was made from Adam. Eve was to be the completer of Adam. That, that's what the Bible said when, when, when the Lord said uh, that He was going to make a help meet for Adam. That is uh, another, another way of understanding that is that basically that uh, she was to be the completer. She was going to give to Adam the things that he lacked in order to be complete. And the companionship of a woman is provided to help man meet all the physical and psychological demands of his unique nature. That's by God's design. Listen, study history, and we find that debauchery and violence will always become a way of life in every exclusively male culture. Study history, you'll find that to be true. Wherever men are in the, in the majority and women are very few and far between, there's no telling what will come out of that. Without the balance that's provided by the woman, man degenerates into a beast. Women, you can say amen right there. So what did, Adam, what did God do for Adam? Here's what it says in verse uh, 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. There's the completer. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought, un, brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. Just stop and think about that for a second. Adam gave names to every creature. And yet people say today, you hear people say this, well, you know, back in that day man was primitive. He didn't really know much. He was kind of dumb. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound to me like Adam was a dumbbell. He could name all the creatures. And, and then verse 20, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and modern anesthesia was born. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And so Adam would find... So think about this. Adam was... Uh, God caused a, a deep sleep to fall on Adam or a sleep to fall on Adam. And while Adam was sleeping, God did a great work. So think about this. How much does God do for us when we're unconscious of what He's doing? How many messes has He kept us from when we didn't even know? How many intersections have we raced through when the light was turning red? And that semi-truck was coming up the road and God let us get through first. Adam would find great blessing from God's work while he slept. Adam knew nothing of this special operation that was being performed on him by a loving God. 
Adam's need was known to the Lord and now it would be met by the Lord. Can, can we say amen right there that God knows best what we need? Every day of our life, every moment of every day of our life, God knows best what we need. We think sometimes, well, I don't have this, I don't have that, and boy, just, you know, God's just, you know, just things aren't going my way. And God knows exactly what we need. I used to tell my daughter all the way until she was 27 years old, God knows where you are, and when He's ready, He will bring your husband to you. You don't have to go on dating sites. You don't have to go on the internet to this the Christian ming. You don't have to do anything. God knows where you are. And when he's ready, he'll bring your husband. Guess what he did? He brought her husband. She thought her biological clock was ticking. But God said, don't worry. I've got this. And I used to tell her this used to make her mad. I would say, apparently God's not ready for you to have a husband yet. Must be you've got some things you need to work on. And she, oh, dad. But in God's time, he worked it out. And now we have a little four-year-old granddaughter who comes and makes her grandfather sick. <laughs> but, but here's the truth. There was no prayer for a wife from Adam. We don't see anywhere in here where, where Adam went to God and said, I need a wife, I need a wife, I'm just not complete with that. There was no prayer, no pleading with God. Uh, as to his need, no sign or promise of what was to come. Adam lay sleeping, and while he slept, God was at work. And when the man awoke, there stood before him, just like we can all testify about our wives, the desire of, a, a desire of our heart was before our eyes. Yeah. Amen? Here's a question. Have you not received blessings for which you did not ask? I think every one of us would be remiss if we were to say no on that. Have we not seen situations and circumstances that were altered miraculously and arranged for our good? Amen? Uh, we, we could testify about all of these things, couldn't we? Have we not seen God answer prayers that we did not even pray? We told you a couple of weeks ago how the Spirit prays for us uh, and the Spirit knows best what we need more than we know ourselves. The Bible said we, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But yet we seem to receive the things that we need and we think back and we say, well, that was really great, I, but I didn't even really ask for that, boy, but I really needed it. God answers prayers that we intend to pray before we even pray them sometimes. Praise the Lord. We'll pick it up there next week, Genesis 2, verse 24, and move on down through the rest of the chapter and maybe get into some of chapter 3. But for tonight, pastor's throat and voice is about ready to go. So we're going to close in a word of prayer. And uh, I appreciate you, your faithfulness to be in the church house. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for another opportunity that we've had to come. And Lord, we know that we're needful people or we're needy people. Lord, we, we don't even know our own needs, but we know you do. And so tonight, Father, we do pray for those prayer requests that were offered up at the beginning. Uh, Lord, for this uh, woman who's having trouble with her daughter, 19-year-old daughter, Lord, don't know all the, cir the circumstances, but we know you do. And Father, we do the, pray that you would break, uh, break hearts and bring those folks to repentance. And Lord, we know also that we have uh, needs right here in our own church family. We think of Brother Frank in the hospital. Pray for him, that you'd meet his needs, that you would undertake for him and do a work there. Lord, for uh, Roger Greeno's family, we pray for them as we get ready to have their service next week. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would just meet these needs according to your perfect will for every life. Lord, we're, we're un, unthankful people most of the time. But, Lord, we ask you tonight to meet our needs uh, as you know best. And that, Lord, we will trust you no matter what comes our way. 
because we know at the end of the day you have our best interest at heart. And so, Father, we ask you tonight to take us home with your mercy. Bring us back on Sunday at the appointed time. And, Father, we do pray also that you would bring out some new folks, that we'd be able to minister to them and be what we're supposed to be to this community. We'll thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen.